Alright, hello and welcome back to part two of our series on the existence of the soul, uh, or the truth of substance dualism. Last time in part one, uh, we basically gave a, a quick overview of the philosophy of mind, a uh, particular aspect called the mind-body problem, and the two major aspects or issues of contention uh, within that field, uh, namely what is the nature of consciousness in terms of mental properties and states, and then the second issue of contention uh, on the subject or the substance of consciousness uh, that, that bears those properties and states. And in part two, uh, we're going to focus exclusively on uh, the first major issue of contention. What, what is the nature of conscious states? and conscious properties themselves. So uh, on this, um, there are three basic, three major basic positions that a person can take. Now the first two I'm going to mention can actually, are actually the same uh, on this specific issue of contention. And this, uh, they're dualist positions. So there's a the mere property dualist. So that's uh, someone like a Buddhist who, who believes that the mental properties and states are show a duality. They are non-physical entities or in nature, uh, but the substance itself, they would agree with atheists and skeptics that it it's just a physical brain uh, that in a central nervous system. That's what we are. Uh, then there's property dualism simpliciter, and this is the traditional Christian perspective that I'm going to be taking in this series. So they would they would both the properties and states and the substance of consciousness or the subject of consciousness are both non-physical substances. For our purposes in this uh, episode, part two, we can combine that and just say there's the dualist option on the object of properties and states, uh, and then there's the physicalist position. Basically, the physicalist position, there are uh, various varieties of that that we'll be looking into uh, later on, at least, uh, five major types. Um, but just in general, what is a physicalist position? Well, basically, as, as I said, this is where they say all conscious properties and states uh, are of a physical nature. Um, they, they refer to properties that, and states that are listed in the physics and chemistry textbooks, the hard sciences in particular. So things like hardness, uh, electrical or magnetic properties, malleability, elasticity, or mass, uh, you know, all, all of these sorts of properties, I, I think we know. The, these are sometimes called primary qualities or primary properties. By contrast, uh, things like color, uh, sensations of color, taste, uh, touch, that sort of thing are, are usually said to be secondary quality. But one thing to mention here with physicalists, they basically say that mental properties and states are quote unquote identical to the physical brain and, and the physical states and properties of the brain and central nervous system. Uh, this contrasts with dualists who basically say, no, all, all mental properties and states are not identical to the physical brain, um, but they are they do stand in cause and effect relations and they are uh, correlated or constantly coincident with physical brain states and properties and that sort of thing. Now in terms of the different types of physicalist interpretations, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna save that for later, but just to give you a heads up right now, there, there are two major categories. There's reductive physicalist theories, uh, which basically means they, these are, this is sort of an outdated notion of physicalism. Uh, two, two of the versions that we're going to be discussing fall under this category and you know this was popular in the 1950s and it's basically saying look all these mental properties and states or consciousness that you refer to can be reduced simply to physical uh, systems we, we can provide a set of necessary and sufficient conditions to explain them whereas non-reductive theories or physicalist interpretations are becoming more popular in modern day um, so that's where we, we don't have there's this mystery factor we, we can't exactly come up with a set of necessary and sufficient conditions to define all mental states and properties and that sort of thing and just to just to illustrate before I was mentioning that the main difference between dualists and physicalists is that Physicalists will say that uh, brain states and properties aren't just constantly correlated or not just uh, standing in cause and effect relations, but they're also identical to it. And uh, one of the atheists, uh, Darren, one of our listeners, sort of asked, well, what, what is the difference about that? So there are a couple examples that I can give. So in, in the first place, what's there's a difference. Cause and effect relations are different from identity relations. 
as per the logical law of identity. So cause and effect is obviously, think of this, a fire can cause smoke. It, it stands in a one-way cause and effect relationship, similar to substance dualists who will say, well, the soul stands in cause and effect relationships with the brain and vice versa. The brain stands in cause and effect relationships with the soul. So it's a two-way cause and effect there. There's also constant correlation um, or coincidence that happens between brain states and mental states. Uh, this neuroscience has proven this, but that doesn't mean proving that doesn't prove that brain states are identical to mental states. So think of uh, something like a triangle. Now a triangle has uh, the property of being trilateral, meaning it has three sides, and triangular, it has three angles. Uh, that doesn't mean that those two properties are, are the same just because they're constantly correlated to each other. They're not identical in that way. So just be aware of that difference. That's going to be important as we get into the, the pro arguments, uh, the pro dualist arguments for properties and states. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get straight into it. Uh, the, the main part of this podcast, I want to present two main arguments that support the notion that conscious properties and states and, or events are in fact mental or spiritual in nature. They're non-physical entity. And I was mentioning, I alluded to before, we got to remember for these arguments to work, you have to remember the logical law of non of identity. In simple terms, states, look, if entity X, uh, such as a, a brain state, is identical to entity Y, such as a mental state of seeing red or a sen red sensation, then whatever is true and or possibly true of X must be true of Y and vice versa. This is a philosophical first principle. Taken as a given, uh, we know it's true. It's a properly basic belief. This logical law of identity is, is true, and it's going to provide us fundamental aspect or premise in a lot of our arguments. So, yeah, uh, let's get straight into it here. So what what's the first pro-property dualism argument that I'm going to bring up? And it's actually a multifaceted argument. So this is basically straightforward. Look, it diff it's called the differences argument. That's what I call it. And it just tries to point to certain differences, provable differences between conscious or mental properties and states and physical properties and states. Uh, obviously, if true via that logical law of identity, they cannot be the same thing. They cannot be identical. Therefore, there must be some non-physical component uh, namely these mental states and mental uh, properties that we have. So in general, uh, what type of differences are we talking about then? That, that's great. I get your argument. It's logical. That would make sense. Uh, if there were such differences, provable differences, then the logical law of identity would prove they can't be identical and that would prove in turn that there is some non-physical component to us. So dualists will point to five features that they say differentiate mental states from physical ones, and we're not going to go over all of them, but uh, we'll do most of them, and I'll, I'll just list them here firstly. So the first uh, difference is in regards to qualia. So that's a fancy word, uh, the plural of quali, um, and it, it refers to the certain raw qualitative feel or the quote-unquote what it is like uh, to be having a mental state. There is this um, property of what it is like to be seeing red, having a red sensation, or seeing green, or tasting an ice cream cone, or having a thought uh, about George Washington. Uh, and it is this, what it is like, or this qualia uh, feeling that mental states have, but physical states do not have. This is, this is the first claimed difference between them, and we'll, we'll go into more detail later in a second. Another difference is mental states, and only mental states, have intentionality, whereas physical states do not. Now, what is, what is intentionality? Well, this refers to our thoughts, our of, some, the ofness or the aboutness. You know, they're, they're directed towards something above and beyond themselves and point towards an external object. I have a thought about... Santa Claus. So the next one is that mental states and properties, they, um, they are inner and private and immediate or direct to the subject having them. Whereas physical uh, states, they're, they're not uh, private um, 
or, or known directly. They're known indirectly through propositional logic or, you know, observation and then making deduction or logical inference and that sort of thing. So that's a difference there. Uh, also, mental states and properties are ne logically necessarily owned by the sentient subject having them, whereas physical properties and states are not owned necessarily by a sentient subject. Um, so that's a key difference right there that a, a lot of property dualists will point to. Uh, and then finally, E, uh, we're not going to get into this. This is very technical, and I, I'm going to leave this out for time's sake. But mental states and properties fail to exhibit crucial physical features, uh, unlike physical properties and states. They lack things like spatial extension. Uh, they're not composed of divisible parts like a neuron is. Um, and another major thing is that they cannot be described adequately using physical language. Usually mental states and properties have to be defined or described ostensively, meaning uh, you know you point to you point to a specific instance of it and go, oh okay, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, a red. Okay, yeah, I've seen that. Or ice ice cream. Yeah, I know what that tastes like. Um, so that they're usually they have to be defined ostensively, whereas physical uh, properties and states are perfectly described by physical language that you can find in a physics or chemistry textbook. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah. Let, let's without further ado, let's let's sort of dig into some of these differences and try to establish some of these uh, some of the differences listed for this argument to work. Now the first one is regarding remember the qualia. There's this what it is like to feel the sensation of red or the sensation of pain, you know, there's this hurtfulness feeling that we have, what it is like to be in pain. Uh, and these are called qualia by philosophers. This is the technical term for it. Um, and these are uh, privy to what's called our phenomenal consciousness. And they present themselves uh, directly to this, to us on a phenomenal, ph phenomenological level. And they're, they're presented directly to us. It's, it's knowledge by acquaintance. acquaintance. Once we have, we, we just know what it is like to see red or to feel pain or that sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, the, this, this is immediately recognized through private introspection. This aspect of qualia, this is the key thing that's differentiating physical properties and states and makes them not identical to mental property, mental properties or states. So what we're saying here is that, look, qualia has, exhibits what's called epistemic subjectivity, typically entailed in, in um, the fact that our consciousnesses have direct access to these uh, various mental states unlike what we have with physical states and that sort of thing. So this is sometimes referred to as uh, these properties or states are self-presenting. You know, so that just sort of means that they're psychologically, psychological attributes that are immediately and directly present to a subject's field of consciousness. I mean, this, this is just obvious. We experience this every day. This is an undeniable phenomenon that takes place for, for conscious creatures like human beings. And obviously, by contrast, physical properties are, are not self-presenting to our consciousness in this way through direct introspection. They, um, instead, we have to come to them through indirect means, as I was uh, trying to say. So I can put this uh, aspect into a premise format for you. So premise number one, a very simple argument. Premise one, no physical properties are self-presenting. We don't have direct access to them. Premise number two, um, and I'm going to make it slightly weaker, some or all mental properties, uh, such as being in a state of pain, are self-presenting. Therefore, via the logical law of uh, identity, some or all mental properties are not physical properties. This is just, lo this is a logically valid argument, uh, but is it logically sound? Well, the uh, second premise, as I said, it, this is immediate. We, we just know this to be true. It, it's obvious. It's 100% proven you're a liar if you deny the existence of qualia. Uh, this immediate through introspection, I know what it, what it is like, what it feels like to be in pain, that hurtful feeling, or what it is like to see red, or that sort of thing. Um, so the controversial premise here would be premise two. Some or uh, would be premise one, I'm sorry. Uh, no physical properties are self-presenting. 
Well, how do we know that? How, how can we substantiate that then, that claim? The, the fact that no physical properties are self-presenting um, and that we don't have this direct access to, to them. Well, we actually have two major pieces of evidence here to warrant this, this claim as a logically sound premise. So the first uh, is that physical properties do not allow for what's called quote unquote private access. So this basically refers to the fact that look, we, we obviously, I uh, am obviously in a privileged position to know what I am thinking or sensing. Um, you know, whatever other ways there might be for finding out if I'm presently s sensing red uh, from a, you know, from a scientific perspective, such as analyzing certain brain states or looking at my behavior or whatever. Um, I obviously have this other way of knowing that I'm having a red sensation and it's not available to anyone else other than me. I have this privileged private access to my own mental life. A good illustration of this uh, is an example is, look, pretend, close your eyes and imagine a pink elephant. A scientist can come along and try to figure out, well, there's no pink elephant uh, in front of you producing this sensation uh, of pinkness. Okay, well, what if they chop open your skull and open and look in there? Again, nothing pink will be in there. They'll have no way of knowing that you're experiencing a pink sensation. Yeah, this, this is obviously because they're not identical. The, the physical property of pink, you know, a light wave on a certain, uh, a light on a certain wavelength or whatever is not present. So the only way that a neuro psychologist could develop, could know that you're sensing pink is by developing a list of correlations. But again, that requires a first person. You've got to tell me, because you have private access, oh, when this brain state activates, you're having a pink sensation. Okay, well then, if I see that brain state again, then I can infer you're having a pink sensation. But they wouldn't know that unless you revealed that to them, because only you have private access to these sensations. Now another example is regard is with regard to mental states uh, are known incorrigibly, mean, meaning you're incapable of being mistaken about that. Physical properties are not known, are not known incorrigibly by the conscious subject. This means that look, when it comes to my conscious mental states and properties, they exhibit uh, epistemic authority, whereas I, this epistemic authority is not present when uh, looking at physical properties and states. I'm incapable of being mistaken about sen that I'm sensing red or uh, I am tasting this or I am having a thought about George Washington. Now, just to clarify there, obviously there can be uh, vague notions where, where uh, someone is, isn't fully aware of their awareness, like they're not concentrating on something and you know, therefore they have a vague awareness where they're confused if they're experiencing an itch or a pain, or maybe they, for one reason or another, they're mistaken. They think they're seeing red, but they're colorblind or, or the light is obscuring the, you know, the rug and actually it's orange or something like that. Uh, so obviously that can happen. But the point is that what's incorrigible is that you are having the sensation of, of that blue rug. Whether in fact it's orange is beside the point. You are not mistaken about the fact that you are having a sensation of blueness um, in front of you. So yeah, these are the two things we, we all know them to be true. Uh, these two warrant the conclusion that these are not physical properties because physical properties uh, do not provide direct access uh, as proven by the fact that they don't exhibit private access and they aren't known incorrigibly by the conscious subject. So yeah, I think this argument is powerful evidence that mental properties and states are not identical. They are different. They exhibit different features that are different from physical properties and states. So yeah, that's the first major argument down there. Let's move on to the second one. So this is with regards, if you remember, to the issue of intentionality. So if you remember, so I was saying uh, intentionality refers to the ofness or the aboutness of mental properties and states. I'm thinking of something. I am. I am. Uh, I, I have a belief about Christianity or. You know, something like that. So they, they exhibit this intentionality and physical properties and states do not uh, exhibit this aspect of being intentional. So yeah, um, to sort of illustrate this, so that obviously through the logical law of 
uh, identity, if there's something true, if intentionality is true about mental states and properties, and it's not true about physical states and properties, uh, again, I could put that into premise format in the exact same way I did above, so you, you get the, the gist of it. Um, but yeah, what? how do we know then? Well, the, the controversial premise will be, but is it true that physical properties and states uh, don't have this don't have intentionality about them. Is that true? Well, uh, in order to prove that, there, there are six differences that, that uh, can be listed between intentionality and physical relations to show the difference. Um, so the first is, look, when we represent a mental act to ourselves, such as an act of thinking about something, there is no sense data associated with it. But this is not the case with physical states and their relations. Um, they're always caused externally by something. Uh, secondly, intentionality is completely unrestricted. Now this is something that's interesting because in terms of the, the kind of object that it can hold as its term. So basically anything, whatever, uh, the, our imagination is the limit, we, we can have a mental act directed upon it. I can uh, think about a unicorn even though they don't exist. I can think about, I can believe in Zeus, even though he doesn't exist. But physical relations only obtain for a narrow range of objects. So, I'm sorry, yeah, so that's about relations. Um, so think of that, with physical relations, they only, magnetic fields, for example, they operate only on certain, uh, or attract certain things. There's this restriction on what they can, what they, what physical things, what physical properties and states can relate to. Mental states are completely unrestricted in their, their relations to an object. It can be about anything. Number three, to grasp a mental act, I must engage in a reflexive act of self-awareness. That's a fancy term, so it basically means you, you have to be aware of your awareness of a tree, for example. But this reflexivity is not necessary or required to grasp a physical relation. You know, Dallas Willard has done a lot of work on that in his book, uh, Logic and the Objectivity of Knowledge, for example. Okay, number four, for ordinary relations, uh, such as X is to the left of Y, uh, X and Y are identifiable objects, irrespective of whether or not they have entered into that relation. Uh, so this is not so for intentional contents. And so let's, uh, to, to illustrate that, so for example, one, one and the same belief can't be about a frog uh, and then later about a house. Five, for ordinary relations, each of the participants much, must exist before the relation obtains. With mental states and properties and with intentionality, um, this can be about non-existent things like Zeus. I can think about Zeus, but physical relations assume that the objects uh, that they're about have to exist before any physical relations can take place. This is again a provable difference. Uh, and finally, number six, and this is that intentional states are intentional, whereas physical relations are extensional in nature. So these are the main differences. Uh, I guess the, the number five and number two one are the, the most important. You know, the fact that you can have this intentionality in the mental state about things that don't exist. That That's not possible for physical relations. You, they Both objects have to exist before they can relate to each other. And the other one is that the fact that the intentionality is completely unrestricted with regard to the kind of object it can hold as its term, whereas physical relations only obtain for a narrow range of objects. Okay, next. Um, so another, uh, the, the last main difference here I'm going to focus on is uh, this notion of a point of view, subjectivity. Mental states and, and um, conscious states and uh, properties require an I, you know, as their subject. It, it requires uh, the first person point of view and that's necessary for their existence. Physical objects on the other hand do not require a first person point of view. They can all be described fully by th the third person perspective. And to illustrate the difference, uh, think of rocks. Rocks have various properties, they have physical relations and states and that sort of thing. They can These can all be described fully using third person perspective language, but it doesn't make any sense to try and describe uh, I am in a state of pain or I am 
sensing red or I am thinking of George Washington. You requires, it's necessary that uh, you need this first person point of view. Now, uh, a skeptical philosopher named Lynn Rudder Baker has tried to counter this by saying, yeah, but that's just uh, language or folk psychology, I guess you could say. But really what we're saying is it's a third person perspective because you can say John Smith is being in the first person point of view of, has the property of being in the first person point of view of John Smith. This is just utterly ridiculous on the part of skeptics. You're desperate. I'm sorry. No, I am John Smith. That's the way you say it. That's obviously true. Uh, I am a subject, uh, and the first-person point of view is necessary uh, to make sense of these mental properties and states. There has to be a mental subject who's having who's having these properties that is described using first-person language only. And another problem uh, is that this being in the first-person perspective of John Smith. It isn't a property in itself. I mean, uh, people are just ipso facto the thing that they are. You know, I, I think there's been a, a good quote by Thomas Nagel. And uh, I just want to read that about this. But he puts it this way. So look, if physicalism is to be defended, the phenomenological features, the felt quality or experiential texture of experiences that make them the kinds of things they are. Example, the painfulness of pain or sound, the pleasurableness of sounds or colors, uh, must themselves be given a physical account. But when we examine their subjective character, it seems that such a result is impossible. Not just improbable, impossible. The reason is that, the every, is that every subject, subjective phenomenon is essentially or inherently connected with a single point of view. And it seems inevitable that an objective physical theory will abandon that point of view. Um, yeah, I think Thomas uh, hit the nail on the head there for, for you skeptics. I mean, this is just obvious, uh, an obvious difference between mental states and properties and physical states and properties. So uh, I, I mentioned there's also the issue of language. Uh, we're going to skip skip that in this podcast. But um, yeah, that's the first argument. I, I've listed and leveled some heavy critiques and arguments that Mental states and properties are not identical. They cannot be identical to physical states and properties. But there are, um, what, what's a skeptical counter to this argument? Do, do skeptics know about this and have anything to say? Um, well, yes. So in the first place, um, with self-presenting features or, or the, some of these epistemic differences, skeptics will say, but these are just epistemic features or just epistemic differences. They, they don't have any ontological importance. You know, another way, it's all an illusion. Of course, of course, skeptics. Yep. Yeah. Um, but anyways, <laughs> basically what they'll try to say, let, let's uh, do it fairly. They'll, they'll say, look, there's, there's two different ways of knowing something like uh, touching and tasting an apple. Um, and in the same way, these uh, these differences, these uh, features of mental properties and states that you're alluding to and say that don't apply for physical states and properties, uh, well, actually, ontologically speaking, it does. But epistemically, it seems different uh, because it's a different way of knowing, uh, just like touching and tasting an apple is a different way of knowing an apple. Um, but this is just complete rubbish and, and desperation on the part of skeptics. I'm sorry, they are ontological. Uh, otherwise, the features above on direct access would not be genuine, but some sort of an illusion. But they obviously are genuine. I mean, think about it. These, these differences that I'm listing are phenomena that everyone knows exists on a phenomenological level only. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm just saying, look, these are features of our phenomenological consciousness or experience. We do have private access to our uh, to our beliefs. Our, our mental states are intentional. Um, I, I do, my sensations are known incorrigibly by me. Um, so these differences are ontological. They are real at the phenomenological level. And that is an, alone enough to kick in with the law of identity. If a phenomenological difference or property is there, that means it's not identical to your brain states or physical brain states and properties which don't have that phenomenological those phenomenological features uh, the law of identity dictates 
x is not y in this case. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, this, this sort of comeback by the skeptics is just total nonsense and it utterly fails. I've proven my case. I, I could end the show here, but I'll throw in one other argument. Um, there's, another, there's a third major one, but for the sake of time, um, this is the second major argument outlining a difference between um, mental properties and states versus physical properties and states in the brain or, or central nervous system or whatever. And this is called the knowledge argument. So this argument really hinges upon, um, let's take as an illustration the example of a blind person, someone who's born blind. They've never seen a thing in their entire life. Um, but they're a neuroscientist. They're the world's expert. They have every single bit of third-party knowledge uh, that a person can get about sight. They've got it. They know everything. They're omniscient when it comes to neurophysiological third-party facts about sight um, and how that works and everything like that, but they've never seen anything. Now suppose, miraculously, this person regains their sight all of a sudden. Well, immediately, this person would come to new first-person knowledge of new facts, uh, such as, you know, the sensation of red. They would have a knowledge by acquaintance of the property and sensation of redness what it is and how it's exemplified in an apple, let's say, if there's a red apple on their desk, they would gain uh, at least six different types of knowledge all at once, but uh, they would also gain know-how, uh, such as being able to differentiate red from other colors, red from uh, the red apple from the green apple on, her, on uh, this person's desk. Uh, they would know how to arrange them into color patterns, uh, such as orange is closer to red than it is to blue. What else? They, they would also ha come to knowledge of, well, red sensations are pleasurable, the green ones are, are, are not pleasurable to me. So yeah, they, they would immediately come to new knowledge that they didn't have before, despite the fact they knew all the third-party scientific knowledge about sight prior to it. So basically the argument says, look, the emergence of this new knowledge from a first person perspective presupposes that there is a realness to secondary qualities like color, uh, taste, sound, smells, these sort of sorts of sensation. These sorts of sensations, rather than what skeptics like to say to this as a counter, oh, but that's just mere representative notion. These secondary qualities are just representative of the true primary qualities, which are physical. Um, and physicalists, uh, David Papineau and Paul Churchland, have really, uh, you know, taken the lead on this and critiquing this knowledge argument. And they've claimed, look, the, the emergence of new knowledge of these secondary qualities in terms of, you know, in terms of this blind scientist now having uh, color sensations and that sort of, that isn't a real uh, property or sensation that it's just a representation of new uh, it's not real new knowledge of new facts like the the sensation of the color redness uh, that's not real uh, all it's just a representation of gaining new abilities or behavioral dispositions when this scientist regains their ability to, to see so here are a couple rebuttals to this skeptical comeback to the knowledge argument so number one First, it's not true. Uh, it's just false and a lie by these skeptical scient uh, philosophers that, look, the, the blind scientist isn't merely gaining access to knowledge that they already had before. This blind scientist, uh, so uh, this contrasts with what's called access consciousness, and I kind of alluded to that in um, part part one. So. Yeah, the, you know, there are three things, if, if you're able to put it into sen sentences or, um, you know, uh, use it for the purposes of reasoning, use this knowledge for the purposes of reasoning and that sort of thing, that's called access consciousness that you directly have access to. So, yeah, what Churchland and Papinar are saying is you gain this new ability and this gives you access to knowledge that was already there uh, about the sensation of red and that sort of thing. But this is obviously, I'm, I'm sorry, skeptics, it's just ridiculous because it, it's obvious, I'm sorry, she's gaining new knowledge of a new fact uh, of this sensation of sight. Uh, the, the data, the information about what it is like, the qualia of redness, of seeing red, didn't exist prior to this scientist regaining their sight. It wasn't there. I mean, we all know it, so this this just utterly fails. 
Uh, secondly, the, this skeptical counter assumes what's called a coarse-grained theory of properties. Fancy word, what does that mean? Well, look, it states that if two or more properties are co-exemplified or constantly correlated, remember that triangle, trilateral, trilateral and triangularity, those are constantly correlated uh, in triangles. Um, but this says, well, if they're constantly correlated, they must be identical, this coarse-grained theory of properties. This is complete rubbish. My triangle proves you wrong, skeptics. My goodness, it's obvious you're wrong. They're not identical just because they're constantly correlated. The coarse grain theory of properties is false. So yeah, I, I think with these two devastating critiques for the skeptics, I don't think Papineau and Churchland's counter argument to the knowledge argument works. And yeah, we have a real, real difference. There's a new knowledge of a new fact, the, the sensation of red, the quale of, of redness, um, that the blind scientist gets upon receiving their sight miraculously. There's also a third rebuttal again about language. I'm trying to keep that out because that's the most technical aspect and I won't get into that. So yeah, the, these are my two, two main arguments. Um, the differences argument uh, exemplified by the three, main, three out of the five main differences that I really spent a lot of time describing. Uh, and then the knowledge argument, the new knowledge argument with this blind scientist regaining their sight. But, but now I think it's important, well, well, let's sort of lay out them. What, what are the various physicalist theories that uh, scientists and philosophers of mind, uh, skeptical philosophers of mind, have tried to come up with to account for, the, for these kinds of data, these, these obvious mental phenomenal properties and states. So the first one, this is really outdated. Uh, I, I don't think anyone adheres to it really anymore today. Um, but this is known as philosophical or analytical or logical uh, behaviorism. So this was really popular back in the 1950s. People all know about in psychology, um, what's his name, uh, B.F. Skinner was an advocate for behaviorism. Uh, and this contrasts, there are different forms. So there's methodological behaviorism. I've got no problem with that, and it's not relevant to our discussion. There's psychological behaviorism, a little bit more iffy, but might be useful. But then there's, here's the big baby, the problem, uh, philosophical behaviorism. This basically reduces all mental and conscious properties and states uh, to be identified or identical to overt body movements or or at least at the very least tendencies to to certain movements given certain stimulus or certain uh, certain uh, inputs so yeah it, it basically reduces all mental properties and states it doesn't focus on your internal mental life at all there are no internal mental facts to speak of at all in this theory everything is said to be completely describable uh, to a third party using th to an external third party uh, using third party to third person perspective descriptions uh, all related to bodily to certain inputs and then bodily outputs so for example to, to illustrate this if Jones is stuck with a pen then like a robot he will wince and shout ouch so this view strictly views consciousness as an input to output uh, in relation to bodily function here and um, as I said, th this view is, is complete rubbish. Uh, nobody believes it. it. It's laughed at in the philosophy of mind today. And But yeah, let, let's go over. There, there are at least six reasons why. And I think most of the skeptics on here will not be advocates of this philosophical behaviorism anyways. Um, but yeah, so here, here, let's critique it. So number one, first of all, mental states are not identical to behaviors. This is just obvious to everyone. Uh, even no matter how much of an atheist you are, this is just obvious because we are through introspection able to come to knowledge of, of certain things. Um, now, here's one thing. So actually, I can have a pain sensation in the case of being pricked without the corresponding behavior. Maybe I don't shout ouch. Maybe I'm a real man or something and uh, I can take it. Um, I don't wince and say ouch. No behavior. Well, I guess I, according to the philosophical behaviorist, I wouldn't be in pain then even though I'd be clearly having a pain sensation. They would be wrong. They're not identical. Uh, what about fake behavior? I can pretend to be having the sensation of pain when I'm not. I can, I can wince and shout ouch, even though I'm not, I don't have any hurtful feeling. 
uh, or this qualia of a pain sensation. So, yeah, I mean, this just destroys this theory. Um, secondly, another related objection is, look, pain, the, the pain sensation is what causes the bodily movement. I get this hurtful feeling, then I go, ouch, uh, wince and say, ouch. It, it, they're not identical to it. It's the cause of the bodily movement. Uh, number three. Uh, pain sensations uh, entail this qualia, this hurtful feeling, this what it is like to have a hurtful feeling. Uh, and that's, as I said, known directly through introspection. But bodily movements don't have this feature. Most people have no idea about what, what the heck's going on to make their arm move in terms of, or, you know, if I'm pricked with a pin, most people don't have a clue what a C fiber, what C fibers are and, and that sort of thing, or what processes are going on physically within me to cause me to be in this brain state or to have this pain sensation. Now, four and five, again, I'm going to skip this. I'm, I'm skipping over the language one. So, but four and five basically say, look, physical language becomes completely unruly and unworkable. If you have to define it, uh, take out all the uh, mental type words and, and relate it all to behaviors. Like instead of I want to go to... Florida, you'll have to say, uh, John is John is picking up travel brochures. John is uh, buying plane tickets, stuff like that. Before, oh, he desires to go to Florida. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, here's the sixth and final one. So uh, obviously, I'm not a fan of philosophical behaviorism. I don't think anyone is today. But but yeah, so here's the final one. So think about this. Look, if one's in a thinking state. Um, let's say I'm thinking of raising my arm, but under philosophical behaviorism, I actually am not thinking anything until I raise my arm because uh, once I get the certain input, uh, I would have no way of knowing what I'm thinking about until I've done the body movement, until it's manifested in my body and I raise my arm. Then I go, oh, I'm thinking about raising my arm. Um, that's complete rubbish. Uh, obviously, we all, I can think about raising my arm and then I do it. I just did it right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we all know that our own thoughts, um, introspectively, as I said, that we don't know it through observing our own body movement. We don't have to wait uh, and then indirectly uh, look at our body movements, go, oh, okay, I must have been thinking about raising my arm. Um, it's more known through immediate introspective awareness. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry if you're a philosophical behaviorist, you, nobody really represents you today. This is just complete garbage. Um, I will provide some sources on it and that's a thing. I got a video by B.F. Skinner uh, from the 80s. So, so yeah, um, I, don't, I don't see this as respectable at all. Okay, well, let, let's move on. What's the next theory? And now we're starting to get into a little bit more respectable territory. Um, so this is uh, what's called identity theory. And there are two... Uh, versions of identity theory. So we're going to start with the uh, first one, which is type type identity theory. So it, it's also called uh, hardware. It's a hardware view and it's the first hardware view. So if you remember, I, I stated earlier in the thing, there are two types of physicalist theories. There's reductive and non-reductive. So type type identity theory is a reductive form of physicalism, just like philosophical behaviorism is a reductive form. They claim to be able to give a uh, set of necessary and sufficient conditions to describe all mental phenomena. Whereas the next version of identity theory is uh, a non-reductive form. But yeah, let's stick to type to type uh, identity theory right now. So certain advocates, again, these were around in the 1950s, but there's uh, UT Place, uh, JJC Smart or John Jameson Smart, uh, Herbert Fiegel. Uh, these are some of the main advocates of type to type identity theory. And in order to understand what we're talking about here, so we have to understand the difference between a type and a token. Um, so uh, in philosophy, so what a, t a type refers to general kinds of things. Uh, you know, something that can be in, like a pain, pain can be in more than one place at the same time. I can be in a pain sensation while somebody, while David J is in a pain sensation at the same time. Um, so it's a general type of thing, a pain type that we experience. Uh, and also it can be at the same place at differing interrupted times. So yeah, so, so a, a token on the other hand is more of a, a specific or particular instance 
of a type. So a particular instance is I am in the token of being in a pain state type uh, or a pain type when I'm pricked with a, uh, whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's pretty clear. So yeah, so to illustrate in terms of relevance with this pain sensation that I always go to, so there's a general kind of thing, right? Um, this pain state and then type type identity theorists will say, well, that's exactly identical to a general type of brain state. Uh, and this is usually, you know, concocted by studying humans. And so, oh, this brain state in human beings equals this pain type uh, mental state. Uh, so they're identical, the type to type or whatever. You know, the, the instance of thinking about unicorns. Um, this is the identical to having Q fiber types that vibrate in a certain manner in the brain. And this view, as, as is, I stated, it's a hardware view. So it, it sees all mental states, they're identical to types of physical hardware states in the brain and the central nervous system. Now, one, one just to sort of differentiate, what, what's the difference between this and philosophical behaviorism, which is another reductive theory? Um, now, this, this main difference, this is a bit technical. So it's just in terms of their identity relation, how they defined it. So type type identity theorists uh, believe that it's a contingent identity as opposed to an analytical identity. Uh, which is what philosophical behaviorists believe. So it, this isn't really that important, but yeah, so philosophical behaviorists, analytical identity means that there's only one valid term that you can use, behavior. Um, when you say, I am in pain, that's, that's invalid. That's not a proper term. You should say, I am, uh, you should be saying, I am uh, in the in the state of C fibers firing and blah 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 or Q fibers firing for my thoughts about a unicorn and that sort of thing. Um, whereas type type identity theorists no there, there can be two different terms uh, I am in pain and also the physicalist terms and they can even have they can have different meanings uh, but really they they are identical they refer to the same thing so think of the morning star and the evening star they're, they're two different terms uh, and they have different meanings, but ultimately they mean they're talk they're identical to the planet Venus. Um, so that's just sort of a, a, a semantical difference between the two theories. So yeah, let, let's get into this then. So there are three fundamental critiques of this version of type type identity theory of physicalism. Now the first uh, is that basically regarding my pro property dualist arguments, the type type identity theory. Uh, isn't true if they're not identical. And I proved with my uh, arguments before uh, that they're not identical. Mental states and prop mental states have intentionality about them. Uh, we have direct access to them in the sense that they're self-presenting properties and that sort of thing. So all of those arguments would disprove this theory right there. You know, me mental states, remember, they're, they're essentially private, inner, and direct qualities that present themselves directly to the subject through simple introspection. Um, they are characterized by qualia, that feeling of what it is like to be seeing red or being appeared to redness and that sort of thing. And they have intentionality and all of that. Now, second, here, here's another, here's uh, the major downfall for this theory. And this is, so this is what's called the problem of multiple or variable realization. What, <laughs> what is that? So uh, think of it this way. Remember, type to type. So a mental state type, a pain type state is identical to a brain state type state. Uh, in, a, in a human being and that sort of thing in these general types. So that's basically saying, look, a, a mental state like a pain type state, let's call that MS1, according to type, type identity theorists, is identical to a certain brain state type of the human body or human brain. Let's call that brain state one. Now here's where the problem comes in because this is these states are realized uh, in various or multiple ways. So dogs experience pain type states. Other animals experience pain type states as well. So they, they experience MS1, mental state one. But yet these creatures by definition can't be in brain state one. They, they're not, they don't have the same brain uh, state types that human beings have. They've got a different brain configuration. They've got different hardware than human beings. Uh, so they have, 
they have BS2, brain states 2, or brain state 3, blah, blah, blah. Not BS1, brain state 1, but yet they experience MS1. This proves that they, they, MS1, or mental states, cannot be identical to a brain state type in a human being uh, because the same mental states and properties also exhibit themselves or realize, become realized in other brain state types such as a dog brain state type or a uh, dolphin brain state type. So yeah, at that point, the skeptic either must admit defeat that uh, this skeptical theory is garbage and wrong and falsified, uh, or the other option is to be a logically absurd fool and deny that animals experience pain. Um, again, we don't have direct access to a dog's inner mental life, um, but it, this seems ridiculous. I mean, the scientific evidence is clear. You prick a dog with a, uh, a pin, he's going to yelp in pain and, and run away. So the principle of charity, the philosophical principle of charity, I'm sorry, dogs experience pain, I'm right, you're wrong if you deny that. Um, so yeah, th this theory is falsified. Now, a third, now as, as we'll see, the, the other theories, the non-reductive theories, so the token-token identity theory, which is coming up next, and functionalism, uh, are physicalist options that try to actually resolve this multiple or variable realization problem. So so the token, the the second version of identity theory, theorists do recognize this problem and have taken measures to uh, resolve it. But at least when it comes to type type identity theory, that this proves it's false. It cannot be true. Um, now, what's the third art? Third and final critique. So this is basically uh, just saying, look, science can't adjudicate one way or the other with type type identity theory between the property dualist notion that brain states are merely correlated and or caused by the soul and mental states or vice versa. Uh, these are both empirically equivalent expl explanations of the same data. However, in light of the differences mentioned uh, in my pro property dualist arguments, uh, as well as this multiple realization problem or variable realization problem. I'm sorry, the property dualist options have greater explanatory power and scope compared to a type type identity theory. Uh, so this is just another failure. Um, yeah, let's let's move on. And now we're getting into non-reductive physicalist uh, theories. And the first one here is uh, the token token identity theory. So this is the second hardware type view. Now the token token uh, identity theory is uh, basically the opposite of the uh, type type identity theory. So instead of looking at general mental state types to mineral uh, brain state types, uh, it's usually mental state types to are correlated with uh, brain state tokens. Uh, so this solves the multiple realization problem because why can dogs have a pain uh, type state, mental state, just like human beings? Presumably it's exactly the same. If you want to say it's it's slightly different, that's uh, you know that's fine. It's 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 a, a a different mental state, but it's within the pain token class type class, right? So it's uh, token token or could be token type. So this is a non this is the first non-reductive form of physicalism. They they don't believe you can have a full set of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, to explain mental phenomena, physical uh, mental properties and states. Major proponents of this view include uh, David Papineau, who I've, I've mentioned before, and Cynthia MacDonald. Uh, so these are a couple people you'll, you'll want to look up and find resources on if you're interested in this view. Um, this is much more respectable. I think it, 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 as, it's, as I said, it solves certain problems. Um, uh, it's probably the second most popular view among atheists and skeptics who are physicalists, or even Christians who are physicalists and that sort of thing. But yeah, so typically proponents of this view, as I said, do solve this multiple or vari variable realization problem because they claim that the similar, similar brain state but yet different, not identical brain state tokens can produce the similar mental state uh, type uh, and or token. But there are several criticisms to this view specifically. So wholly apart from the multiple realization problem, in the first place, the other two critiques that I raised against the type-type identity theory do apply. The differences argument, the knowledge argument, 
prove that these are not physical properties and states. Therefore, it, the token-token identity theory cannot be true. Uh, also, the knowledge argument would apply against this token-token identity theory as well. However, there is another problem that uh, is actually uh, unique to these non-reductive token-token identity theory as well as other functionalism, as we'll see. But this is basically what we call the token unifying uh, relation problem. So uh, think of it this way. So, okay, we've got brain state type, uh, brain state token number one and a human, brain state token number two and a dog. Uh, and they both produce the mental state type, MS1, and or very similar features, uh, mental state pain token, or a, and a dog mental state pain token. Uh, but what is it that, how do you, when they're just opposite, what is it that unifies these uh, token, pro, these uh, mental state tokens into a pain type, as opposed to being in a smell type? sensation or a, you know a class of smells what is it that unifies these together now now obviously the dualist can easily answer this the property dualist can just say well that's easy individual pain types and tokens uh, possess something in common that's internal to them this essential qualia no uh, hurtful feeling aspect to them taking place on a non-physical level and this is what unites them all together you know this this felt quality that's inherent to it but this cannot apply with token token identity theory or physicalist there's literally nothing that should bind them together into a class called pain of various pain types of a pain type or various pain tokens and that sort of thing so there's nothing that can unify them under a physicalist view now just so you know uh some token token identity theorists try to overcome this a little bit um, by, by some of these objections by combining themselves with functionalism, which is another view that we're about to learn about next. Um, but yeah, functionalism has its own reasons um, for failing, so we're, we'll get into that in a bit. But yeah, so these are the main issues with token-token identity theory. Yeah, let's move, let's get into functionalism then. Okay, so uh, this is by far the most popular physicalist alternative. It's what I think most atheists and skeptics are. It's also known as the artificial intelligence view or the software view. Modern day computer with hardware and uh, software, computer program, is sort of the analogy used to describe this. Now, functionalism is similar to philosophical behaviorism in that it explains mental events uh, through certain inputs and then functional outputs, such as functional behaviors of the body and brain. Uh, but it also alludes to this functional causality uh, called realizers. Um, and this is a non-reducible internal mental state. Um, no, obviously, that, that are causally connected. They stand in cause and effect relations in sort of the same way that computer software is, you know, causally effective inside a, a, the hardware of a computer. But yeah, ultimately, um, they'll say that this is physicalist in nature. But it is important to note that some substance dualists could actually, sub, or substance or property dualists could actually be functionalists. I mean, the, the soul is could be said to be this software, this information. Remember, I kind of mentioned that about Tom, Thomas Dick or Aristotelian substance dualist, for example. Um, but obviously, the physicalist version of functionalism says, no, it's, it's basically, they, they say all the causally active internal states are neuro, neurophysiological states uh, of the brain and central nervous system. So this is this is somewhat, uh, sometimes been said, these called the strong artificial intelligence uh, model for the mental, where the mind is fundamentally seen as software or computer program, along with the inside of a computer, that the hardware of your, your brain and that sort of thing. Um, so recent advocates of this view include uh, David Lewis and Wegon Kim. So yeah, what there are some objections to this view. So let, let's there's several objections actually of, of this this version of physicalism, which is the best option that I see that there is. So in the first place, we have this problem of what's called inverted qualia. So remember the the defining characteristics of a mental or conscious state is the logical or causal relations of the input 
to the output to, for the organism as a whole. And that contrasts with the internal traits of the state itself, which is known directly through introspection. Um, so to illustrate what this inverted qualea problem for functionalism is, uh, let's suppose that uh, John Smith, is he's got normal sight and that sort of thing, and then he's competing with uh, Jim Jones, who's uh, a colorblind person. Now, both, pe both people would be able to sort uh, all the red objects versus green objects in a room using their using their uh, their their sense right of their sense of this is redness and they would call it the same words and that sort of thing, but the colorblind person wouldn't actually be having the same internal mental state even though the same function would be coming about uh, in terms of him them both organizing all the red and green objects and separating them from each other. But actually, Jim Jones would be, because he's colorblind, would be having a sensation of blue or orange or whatever you want to say, whereas John Smith would be having a different internal sensation of redness. So, so obviously, this sh shows the fact that functionalism doesn't work. Now, there's another, um, a better example uh, or that uh, some philosophers have uh, mentioned. Uh, so, so, a philosopher, John Searle. Surly uh, has given the example of the Chinese room. So let's picture uh, a room where you're like, uh, so this is trying to make you the analogy of you're like a computer, right? Uh, let's say you don't know a word of Chinese, you don't understand it at all. You can be given a list of instructions on, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. So if, if you're given uh, a squiggle squiggle, you put a squaggle squaggle over here and, and in this way, you can put together sentences in Chinese. Uh, they give you a question uh, written in Chinese, and then you take you break it up into the you know these individual things. If this input of a squiggle squiggle output function, I do a, a squaggle squaggle. Functionally, I'm I'm giving the right answers. I could become so good at this type of thing that it would look like, hey, I'm actually I actually know Chinese, even though I don't have a clue what the heck's going on. I have no internal mental awareness uh, or knowledge of uh, what's going on in these cases. So yeah, the, the Chinese room uh, with the person inside would simulate a computer to an outside person. Uh, for a person outside, the room receives inputs and then gives outputs in a way that makes it appear that the room understands Chinese. Uh, but of course, all the room does is, in this case, it just imitates mental understanding. It does not possess it. Computers are just like the Chinese room and under functionalism we're just a fancy computer. Uh, but obviously this isn't the case. Uh, we have, uh, we don't just imitate mental operations but we actually exemplify them. Our, our mental states have intentionality, have uh, real semantic, semantic content for example. Uh, computers and uh, you know software programs don't have this um, so yeah I think this proves functionalism is false right there um, however what about there's also a second uh, related objection to functionalism as well and this is known as the problem of absent qualia uh, so according to functionalism computers or robots are capable of imitating conscious states and properties you know by embodying the right functional state so yeah so you know a computer can be programmed to say ouch when stuck with a pen but you know uh this isn't genuine this isn't a genuine mental sensation of pain they don't have this quality of uh, this uh, hurtful feeling they're just programmed and mindlessly carrying out the functions that they're programmed to do so yeah there's not only the inputs and outputs but there's also these other internal um, states or brain states that factor into creating this functional output but that doesn't say anything about a computer actually feeling pain also the same deal with token identity theory uh, they also have the problem of unifying mental types and classes from brain state tokens yeah pain is not defined only by an input and then the same output of shouting ouch you know stick with your pen output of ouch the function or behavior and the relation of other mental states like a desire for pity and that sort of thing that does not describe the internal essential feeling or hurtful feeling of pain, the sensation of pain. So what is it that unifies these various internal pain sensations in dogs and humans and that sort of thing? It's the same as 
token identity theory, the criticism there. Yeah, so I think that's it for functionalism. The final uh, form of physicalism, this is the worst out of all of them. It's, it's, it's sort of new. It's called eliminative materialism. Uh, this is very radical uh, for the physicalists. Um, you know, adherents of that, this view would be people like Richard Rorty or Paul Churchland, who we've referenced earlier in the series. And it's basically the view that mental state descriptions, so it's, it's we have to understand uh, replacement theory in science, right? So outdated scientific theories like the ether and, and entities get disproven and replaced with new scientific theories that are better. As part of that, certain terms and words like an ether or phlogiston fluids and that sort of thing, uh, okay, that's just nonsense. They get replaced and thrown out. So with relation to the mind and body problem, they'll say, well, that's the same with you know, all these mental properties and states, when you say, I desire this, blah, 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 that's called folk psychology. That's part of the old theory. It has nothing to do with reality. You've got to replace that with uh, purely neurophysiology uh, theory descriptions for these mental states and properties. This is the new replacement theory that you need to recognize how radical this view is. So it's not just saying that, look, mental states like thoughts or beliefs are reducible in some way to the physical states in the brain or identical to, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just saying that they're identical to physical states in the brain or that sort of thing, but it's saying they don't, they, they don't and never did exist in the first place. There, there is no such entity as a pain sensation. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Uh, and this is just complete rubbish and ridiculous nonsense. We all know 100%. Doesn't You could be the most skeptical person in the world, but obviously we know that these, and I obviously I'm slightly biased, but I mean, this, this view is quite radical. And again, I, I'd be providing some sources to look into it from Paul Churchland and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, they're even saying, even at a phenomenological level, this is an illusion. They're, these aren't genuine phenomenon that people experience, being a hurtful feeling or I am thinking a thought or having a thought. Yeah, eliminative materialists have to deny any existence for these mental states and properties whatsoever. I don't care if you're a physicalist and you take a functionalist view or whatever, you, you're going to be with me that these guys are out to lunch. I mean, at the very least, these happen on a phenomenological level level these these things exist they happen yeah these are the five different forms of physicalism and just to close we we i think we've demonstrated rather conclusively that mental properties and states are not identical to brain or physical states and identities furthermore all of the various the five various physicalist explanations for these phenomena have failed in one way or the other uh to account for the net known mental phenomena and data that we experience in our in our uh, lives every day and yeah the the knowledge argument and the differences argument i think make it rather conclusive these mental states and properties of, of consciousness uh cannot they're not identical to physical states uh and properties in the brain or central nervous system they can't be the same rather conclusive given the arguments that i've given and uh the differences that show there can't be identical so yeah, on that, on that basis, I think it's rather ironic that some skeptics will sort of biasly accuse the dualists of, property dualists of making things up out of desperation. But yeah, this is really just projection on, on their part. And uh, I think it's kind of fitting to read a quote from, again, John Surley. And yeah, and he was writing about, you know, how physicalists or materialists kind of are just say whatever they, they can out of desperation to explain this data because the... The issue of consciousness is a real problem for them, and I, I think they, they realize this. So here's what John Surley says. So, early materialists argued that there aren't any such things as separate mental phenomena at all, because mental phenomena are identical with brain states. More recently, materialists now argue that there aren't any such things as separate mental phenomena because they are not identical with brain states. I find this pattern very revealing, and what it reveals is an urge to get rid of mental phenomena at any cost, out of sheer desperation. Uh, so yeah, I, I concur wholeheartedly with that. I mean, there's this shift from reductionist physicalist theories to a non-reductive physicalist theories. Yeah, the non-reduction part, that's the soul. 
uh, come on guys. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's my take. Uh, yeah, next time in part three, we're going to turn our focus to provide a positive case for substance dualism. Uh, that the immaterial or non-physical soul itself exists, or, or, or a substance, a non-physical substance is us. The subject that bears the various mental properties and states that we've been talking about in part two here, itself is non-physical uh, in essence and nature. So yeah, uh, tune in for that, and thank you very much. Bye-bye.